Well, first of all, thank you, Alison. You know, this is and the whole Foresight Group. Uh, it's really a distinct privilege to be to be here. Uh, yeah, well, given that seven minutes are not that long, uh, I will get straight into into the point. So I fundamentally think that uh, aging uh, is an epigenetic uh, problem, an epigenetic issue, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, epigenetic fundament the epigenetic program fundamentally controls uh, how the cells function, right? And so if they become dysfunctional over time, it's because there is something wrong in the epigenetic program. Now, this can be caused in part by a lack of maintenance of, uh, you know, the correct program, which probably is, de is developmentally regulated in ways that we still are far from understanding. But then obviously there are, you know, triggers from outside, right? Uh, sun exposure, diet, stress, lack of sleep, uh, and so on and so forth that lead to accumulation of additional mistakes in the epigenetic program. Now the good news is that uh, uh, this epigenetic program. Well, the bad news is that it's very complex uh, because there is a lot of things: and methylation of DNA, histone positioning, histone changes, 3D organization of the chromatin. But the very good news is that uh, it's programmable, so it doesn't exist in a zero-one conformation as the as the genetic program, but it exists uh, in a number of uh, you know uh, gray shades. Uh, from zero to one, and those those are programmable, so they can be reset. And there's plenty of examples of this, so I don't have to really kind of show and prove that the epigenetic program can be reset and reorganized. Okay. So uh, taking all this into account, uh, you know, it can be reset and can be reprogrammed. My lab uh, in 2020 developed a technology that is called epigenetic reprogramming of aging. Uh, we call it ERA, uh, and uh, we have shown, uh, we were the first to show that it works in human cells. And basically, in principle, the way it works, and now the, the technology is uh, licensed to TURN, which is a company that I funded, that is basically using the mRNAs that, you know, we utilize exclusively mRNAs, and obviously the delivery system, which is very important. So in a nutshell, what we do is just to take this cocktail of factors, deliver them into the cells, into all the dysfunctional cells. And by virtue of doing that, we turn that cell. It's still the same cell type, okay? So no misunderstanding here. We're not making, you know, we're not reprogramming cells from one cell type to another cell type. No, it's still the same cell type. So if it is a stem cell, it's still a stem cell. If it's a fully differentiated somatic cell, it's still the same fully differentiated somatic cell. It's important because there is a lot of mm -hmm. misunderstanding here. But since we're working at the very core mechanism of, of uh, cellular function, by changing, uh, by expressing these factors and by changing the epigenetic landscape, we affect most, if not all, of the hallmarks of aging simultaneously. Now, I'm not saying every single hallmark in every single cell type, because cells age in different ways. It is not true that the cells, you know, different cell types age across all the hallmarks in the, in the very same way and across all the hallmarks. That's another misunderstanding. For example, the stem cells, you know, couldn't care less uh, about, you know, some of the hallmarks. They just age uh, for some, just a subset. Now, the good thing here is that ERA, whatever hallmark changes with age can simultaneously impact those changes, okay? Not only that, but it can actually be used and utilized in a variety of different uh, tissues. And uh, the company right now is working on immunology and dermatology, but, uh, you know, to the, the end of my presentation, in, like the path ahead, I would like to discuss this with you. <clears throat> so just a glimpse of data. I want to really make sure that maybe we have questions. So first of all, dermatology. So if applied in cells, uh, the epigenetic reprogramming, as you can see, so we are just expressing six factors. And as a readout, as an outcome of that, we have increased expression of ECM proteins, like the collagens. We have decreased expression of uh, the bad guys, uh, like the MMPs, uh, that are enzymes that degrade uh, the extracellular matrix. And we have decreased expression of SOD, which is a, a, an oxidative stress-related gene, okay? Not only that, but uh, these, these experiments are done in tissues, abdom abdominal skin taken from people. 
uh, when we deliver the era inside the skin, we see at the protein level, I don't know if you can see it well, but at the protein level, we see decreased expression of SOD protein. So you can see it quantified here. And we have increased expression, for example, of collagen 7, which is an ECM component that decreases with time. So this is just a glimpse of dermatology. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through the ton of data that we have, but you know that, that's the way it is. And uh, the next is immunology. So you are an exclusive group of people because I'm showing this special preview to you. So the data will be released tomorrow at the AACC, AACR. Uh, so here you see the effect of ERA on old uh, exhausted immune cells. So on the left side, so the, the cells, the immune cells, the T cells, are mixed with the target cancer cells, okay? So the T cells are supposed to recognize the cancer cells, which are here in green, and they're supposed to kill them, okay? Now on the left side, you see in both cases, in the control and the era treated, the cells are, have been engaged for four consecutive times with the cancer cells, meaning that four times in a row, the same cells have been challenged with new cancer cells, okay? Because that's pretty much what happens in vivo, right? They are continuously challenged with cancer cells that are there, that are waiting, waiting to be attacked, right? And they are in large numbers. On the left side, you see that the control at, cannot kill the cells. On the right side, you see that after nine hours, the cells that have been treated with ERA are basically capable of clearing out, you know, all the cells, all the cancer cells. So it's obviously there's more work to be done, <laughs> but this shows that two things. Well, first of all, that the treatment from a functional standpoint enhances the endogenous capacity of the cells to do what they're supposed to do, which is killing cancer cells in this case. Second thing is that we are preserving cell identity. Because if the cells were becoming something else, they wouldn't be killing the cancer cells because, you know, that's a prerequisite of T cells. So that's a functional way to prove that our cells haven't lost their identity. But they're much more powerful in doing that. Okay? So to go back to the title, the path ahead, well, the path ahead in the short term for TURN is to move dermatology and immunology to clinical one phase, you know, uh, step. And we are raising Series A money, right, as we speak. So if you're interested, let me know. Uh, because we really want to push these programs. You know, there is a lot of, um, you know, hope. And we really want to move this fast forward to, to, for the fruition of people in a democratic way. Uh, for everybody, okay? Second thing, and this is kind of an open discussion, I think that ERA or epigenetic reprogramming in general, I think has a lot of implication and applications across many different tissues. So could be one of the universal systems that could be used, not alone, but that can be used across many different cell types and tissue types. There's beautiful work done by others in uh, heart regeneration, optic nerve regeneration, muscle regeneration. So it, it's really a wonderful way to actually tackle many different tissues. Uh, so I think that you know, there is a lot there. Uh, and the second thing to kind of tie back to the need of biomarkers, we are at the point where rejuvenation interventions are going to be working. You know? So we really need also a reliable set of markers to not only to measure aging, but also to measure the outcome of these interventions. So that's why I'm so excited about the biomarkers of aging consortium. And that's why I think I'm, you know, really there should be contribution for all of you guys, because we, we really need to get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the statement that the cells don't lose identity yeah. during your treatment, is that, is that same true throughout the duration of your treatment? Uh, well, it depends on how long the treatment is. It's an excellent question. The treatment needs to be transient. If it's too long, then they lo you lose cell identity, absolutely, because that's the, you, you get IPS or, or something similar to IPS. So that's key. And that's why the mRNAs are really key in this case, because you can really guarantee a very transient defined uh, mm, you know, uh, expression of, of the factors. And how long is it? It depends on the cell type. So it could be anywhere between two and four days. 
And this is based on the stem cells and I guess my rule has them. So in muscle stem cells, it's 48 hours. Uh, in chondrocytes, it's three days. Uh, in fibroblasts, it's four. In the blood cells, uh, we're still trying to optimize the window because we're still trying to see if we can even expand that window of time. It depends also on the factors that you use. If you use six, uh, it's uh, shorter. If you use less, it's longer. So there is a lot of nuances. Yeah. So with any mRNA, like LMP technology, normally you're going to get massive heterogeneity on transfection, right? Yeah. So how much does that affect? Like, do you just need you know a certain amount, or something gets transfected more, or a subpopulation gets transfected? How, like, how does that affect? Yeah, we are working on that very heavily because it's a very important question, uh, right? The, the 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 LMPs that we have developed so far, for example, in blood cells, they target ninety five percent of the cells, uh, and they have uh, ninety nine percent viability. Uh, obviously, for in vivo applications, it's a little bit more complex, uh, but we're working uh, ways to actually target efficiently uh, the cells that we want. Uh, for example, dermal fibroblasts yeah. or keratinocytes. Well, I just think of efficiency. There's the efficiency of how selected your cells are. But there's also efficiency of like how many LMPs get to each cell. Absolutely. Right? That, that also depends on the route of administration. For example, if it's microinjection, if it's topical, if it's microneedling. Uh, so yeah, there's, we are at, we are actively working with that because it's a, it's a crucial problem. Yeah. Great. Now, what is the question that challenges you? Oh, uh, reproductive aging. I think we should study reproductive aging, in particular ovarian aging. I think it's super super interesting, um, and uh, it has a lot of implications. Um, well, there's obviously awesome work from Jennifer Garrison, and then I think it, like started planning the repro glands recently. Right that there's more to be done. Uh, in p first, because the studies, as we have learned, on, on, on females or women, <laughs> you know, have been <laughs> are severely underrepresented, <laughs> you know, historically, and I think that's not acceptable. Um, and, and second, because I think it, it has a lot of implications, you know, on its own, uh, just on a, you know, 50% of the population. So it's, the, yeah. Wonderful. It's a great <laughs> to the board now. Thank you very much. Thank you.